want to welcome all the attendees um, to our exciting webinar event with a most accomplished character setup artist. And we at the CGMA are lucky to have him. Uh, he's been a part of some of the most important films to help advance the evolution of film special effects in the entertainment design industry. Over his career, he's created and contributed work at several pioneering effects studios, including renowned Industrial Light and Magic, the Tippett Studio, and Sony Pictures Imageworks on seminal film characters like Optimus Prime and Transformers, or Davy Jones on Pirates of the Caribbean or Dead Man's Chest or The Amazing Spider-Man more recently. Um, with experience stretching as far back, and now I understand even further back, uh, than the Matrix Reloaded and Matrix Re Revolutions. He has led teams of character setup artists in films like Hotel Transylvania, Angry Girls, Edge of Tomorrow, just to name a few. Love that film, by the way. With over 20 years experience in the field of visual effects, feature animation, and VR, let's give a hearty and warm welcome to Tim Coleman. Woohoo! Yeah! All right. Thanks, Greg. Thanks for everybody attending. All right, that's good. Good to have you, man. Hey, listen, um, just to kind of, uh, before we get going and before I hand over the reins, I, would, I just wanted to thank you for ha uh, being on board with us, Tim. And before we get started, I just want to thank our sponsor, the CG Master Academy for hosting this webinar. The CG Master Academy is the leader in online digital arts education in film, animation, and games. And we're thankful for the generous sponsorship. Uh, just a note to all the attendees, uh, guys, we are um, going to be at during the uh, course of the webinar collecting uh, questions from you guys and hopefully be able to work them into the discussion. Uh, so we're going to ask you if you can use the button below. Uh, there's a specific Q&A menu uh, when you click on it on the Zoom button and um, you can put relevant webinar questions to the subject matter or whatever he, um, uh, Tim is talking about uh, within that. And we're gonna hopefully try to get to as many as we can. So um, I'm just gonna uh, hopefully um, be able to be uh, conscious when the questions are coming through and then eventually try to work them in. And if we don't get them in during the discussion, we'll try to make some time at the end, time permitting uh, to get the Q&A portion uh, in at the end. Uh, and that's about it. So. Um, Anyway, I'm going to go ahead and give the reins over to our guest, Tim, who has got some amazing, amazing stuff to share. All right. Great. And uh, let me go ahead and uh, stop the share. And then you go ahead and you take over, sir. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. Let me find the right screen. All right. I'm already getting excited, Tim. <laughs> I'm already getting excited. This is pretty amazing. Well, thanks again, everybody, for attending all from all over the world. Literally, it's pretty exciting to, to hear that, uh, you know, we got people in Tokyo and Turkey and the UK, Paris, US. Um, that's pretty amazing. So I'm pretty honored to be talking to everybody um, all over the world. And thanks again, Frank, for the intro. And thanks to CGMA. Uh, for having me, uh, for inviting me to teach this course. I'm really excited about it. It's a course I've been wanting to do for a long time. And uh, so I'm kind of starting things off by showing some clips from various kind of mechanical rigging uh, oriented movies that I've worked on. And during the Q&A, if you have, you know, any questions about anything that I've worked on or uh, anything related to like stuff I'm showing, just feel free to ask. I'm more than happy to, to try to answer things. Um, so uh, on the top here, we're looking at some clips that I got out of the behind the scenes uh, video for Transformers. And uh, I just saw so much cool stuff in that that brought back a lot of memories. So I, I, I kind of put that together. Then down the lower left is uh, of course, uh, the APUs that I rigged for the Matrix Revolutions. And then uh, one of my favorite projects on the lower right, Edge of Tomorrow, which is just uh, an incredible project. It's, it's challenging in so many ways for a character set up arts, but also for everybody involved, um, just the sheer amount of stuff that uh, had to be built and uh, rigged and animated, mocap, everything. So, um, and this crazy creature on top of it all. Um, 
So uh, anyway, so um, so we're doing good, Frank. You can see the screen and everything's looking good. Yes, everything's looking good. How about the attendees? Everything looking good on the attendee side? Thumbs up is good. We'll take a thumbs up. All right. Um, let's make sure we're getting enough of them. Cool. Chat. Awesome. Let's see. Okay. Yeah. Um, cool. All right. Well, I guess I'll, uh, I'll continue on, but just anybody, if anybody has any problems seeing anything, just, uh, just let us know. All right. Looks so, great. Um, All great. Great. So uh, I guess what I'm going to cover today is I'm going to just kind of introduce myself a little bit. Um, uh, a little about me. Uh, I grew up in San Diego, California, and, um, you know, I got a lot of early access to computers when I was a kid. And there was a lot of like really crude computer games that I got into, but I was really interested in how, how those games were made. And they were, you know, 2D pixelated artwork. And so that I think kind of got the bug going for me to be interested in computers and making stuff with computers. Um, and then when I get into, got into college, I studied architecture. And that was, uh, I think, kind of a premonition of where I was going to go with things and that it's kind of a, a, a discipline where it's a combination of art and technical. And uh, so you got like the, the visual design of buildings, and then you have the actual building those buildings and cons constructing those. And so it was a blend that was really interesting to me. But unfortunately, when I got out of college, there was a lot of jobs for young architects. And so I was kind of scrambling to find something that I could pay the bills with, you know, so that would, um, I think, uh, for, for a year or two, I was a, an Adobe Photoshop guy where I would just like worked in an art department for a, a company and all I did was scan CD covers for a year. <laughs> and um, so that wasn't really glamorous or anything like that. But um, in that art department, there was a guy doing 3D on a silicon graphics computer. I don't know if many of you know what those were, but uh, those are uh, really high end computers that cost a lot of money back in the 80s and 90s that uh, did really advanced 3D graphics. And so there was a guy there doing 3D art and he was using this really expensive, like $50,000 machine and he was doing art. And so I kind of, uh, you know, would get him coffee and things like that and have him kind of show me what he's doing. And uh, I would look through the manuals. And then one, one evening he said, hey, you know, when I go home in the evening, if you want to get on and, you know, just play, play around with stuff, go for it, you know. So I took him up on it. And uh, so I got, a, I got myself kind of oriented with um, – you know, the 3D software I was using, I, I wasn't really creating anything extraordinary or anything like that, but uh, it really kind of opened my eyes to this uh, 3D graphics, kind of high-end 3D graphics and, um, and animation and things like that. And uh, when I was in, in uh, college, I, I was doing some 3D modeling. So I was modeling buildings with like really crude 3D software. Um, that's, that's where I was getting my real taste of 3D and, and creating things in the computer. And it was really exciting. And I wanted to, I wanted to kind of ditch the same, the, you know, the traditional uh, architecture route and kind of get more into uh, creating things with the computer. And so after school, I moved to the San Francisco area in California. And I, I started getting jobs in multimedia, doing 3D um, or whatever I could do to pay the bills, you know. And, um, and I happened to land this one job that I think really kind of kicked me off, which was uh, I got a job as a demo artist and, um, and they were gonna train me for free. And what, uh, what they needed is somebody who could demonstrate 3D software to potential customers. So I would be like the demo guy, I would show them how to like, you know, launch the software, build things, animate things. Um, and things like that. And then there would be a guy who would be trying to have them buy the software. So he'd be the sales guy. So and, it was a combination of sales and um, uh, kind of uh, teaching all at the same time. Yeah. And I, I wasn't really, you know, I didn't handle any financials or any of the sales per se, but I would be interfacing with the client yeah. and, and they would be like, you know, I need to build this product in 3D and I need to for like a marketing campaign. And so I would have to kind of show them, well, this is basically how you would do with this software, or this particular software is very strong at doing stuff like that. Um, but what was, what was cool about it is, is that every time we met with a different client, client, there was a different problem they were offering up that we needed to solve or give them a reason why they should use this software to solve their problem. So that kind of quickly got me into this mindset of like problem solving, creative problem solving, which was, um, 
stuff that I keep coming back to as a rigor. Like I, I think character TD might be a kind of a limiting title. Um, I think for, I think what, uh, what I do for a living and I see what other character TDs do is that it's more than just like laying down joints and skinning and, and painting weights and things like that. Um, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, but it's really all about creative problem solving. Um, and then from there, um, I made a short film with a buddy of mine in my living room called Bowling for Souls. And that was in a animation festival uh -huh. that uh, it just got our name out there a little bit. Uh, we won a few film festivals with it. Um, it also was like my demo reel. It was like my first demo reel was this short animation that I did. And because um, up to that point, I didn't really have a demo reel. Um, and, and so that that short got me get my foot in the door at uh, Tippet Studio. Um, because in my short, I, I had um, I had rigged like a devil character and some bowling pin characters and things like that. So it showed showed them that I could rig. You know, that's pretty basic compared to what Tippet Studio was doing. So that was my first character TV job, and that was back in 1999. So it's going a ways back, 20 years. <laughs> Still can't believe it. And then, um, and I'm going to advance to the next uh, next frame so you can see some of my uh, other non-mechanical rig. Uh, stuff. Um, but so, you know, I, I've just been so lucky and had some great opportunities to work on some just really cool characters. Um, you know, like, you know, I have lots of memories of like, you know, being at ILM and I was working on Pirates of the Caribbean and I remember being approached about, hey, would you be interested in rigging Optimus Prime? And I, like, I was like, my, I think my job was, was open. And, and I think because they knew that I rigged the APUs in the Matrix movies that they were like, ah, this guy could probably handle doing Optimus Prime. So they're like, they're offering it to me to see if I wanted, if I was interested. And I said, of course I'm interested. It sounds like an incredible challenge. And, and lo and behold, I didn't know what I was really getting into at the moment. Um, but uh, probably better that you didn't. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. I was much more young and innocent at that time. <laughs> um, so, but you know, over the 20 years, I, I think I've worked on a, uh, you know just as many VFX films as I had feature animation films. Um, so uh, they, I really like both. You know, I can't say that there's uh, one style that I prefer over others. It's just that, again, like I love, uh, you know, solving creative visual problems, you know, and, and uh, I love being like presented with artwork or concept artwork or ideas and like, how, how are we going to execute that and trying to like work with other people uh, come up with ideas of how we're going to achieve the solution or how we're going to achieve the end result. Um, so, uh, you know, like the feature animation stuff, you know, uh, is more exaggerated and, you know, those productions, you know, tend to run a lot longer, you know, so maybe like a year or two for an uh, animated feature at times. So you're kind of in it for the long haul. Um, animated features have lots of assets, you know, so there's lots of characters, everything CG. Whereas in VFX, you know, it's all about photorealism, um, shorter deadlines. Um, you know, you really got to crank things out. You really got to be on top of, uh, you know, when problems arise, you know, you really got to, you know, put on your thinking cap and try to figure out how you're going to get around the problems and work with other departments to figure out the best way to do things. So, hey, Tim. Uh, yeah. Just, uh, just so I wanted to jump in here. Just so, what were, you know, you've shown us some amazing stuff here already. Yeah. If you had to pick like your most challenging VFX project to work on, what comes to your memory first and, and, and <laughs> why? I mean, because uh, there might be different things about one type of animation that you have to rig for compared to another. Uh, there's what you like and then there's what's tough. And yeah. sometimes tough is fun, but sometimes tough is just tough depending on your right. deadline. Right. Well, I mean, to be quite honest, I think it's a tie. And I think it's a tie between Transformers and Edge of Tomorrow. I think those are really the most challenging products I've ever worked on. Edge of Tomorrow because of the, the alien creature. The, the alien. I remember seeing the artwork for the first time, and I was just like, the, one of the first times we were like, I really had no idea how we were going to pull it off because it literally was like a ball of tentacles. And, you know, strands of tentacles could pop out at any time. And it was kind of an omnidirectional creature, which I have never done. And I don't think many people have. Um, but, uh, and then for uh, Transformers, it was just the sheer amount of uh, geometry and the pipeline at ILM. I was still relatively new at ILM at the time. And 
Um, there's like, they were using some proprietary software. So like you would rig in Maya and then you would have to get it into the proprietary software. And then I remember like really being, you know, had some stumbling blocks where like I'd rig in Maya and it would look awesome and it would work great. And then I put it in the proprietary software and it would explode, you know? And so I'd be just like, ah, oh, geez, you know, what am I doing wrong? So it was just uh, one of those things where like, I just, I didn't have time to get frustrated. It was more like, I just got to talk to people. I talked to people who have been there longer than me and talked to them about, okay, you know, can you give me some insight on what I might be doing here wrong and, um, and things like that. So, um, but like for both of those films too, it's like when I first started seeing like what the animators were doing with my rigs uh, or seeing the renders, that's when like, the motivation, you almost like the juice starts flowing again. And you're like, you may be a little down at that point because the beginning of the show before animation really gets into shot production is where you're doing your work. You're getting the rigs ready for shot production. And, um, but when the animators start bringing it to life, that's where you're just like, wow, this is, this is making it all worth it. This is really uh, spectacular. So that motivation keeps me going to the next film and to the next project. And um, so it makes it, makes it, um, really fun. And every, every project's got its unique challenges. It's, uh, it's pretty incredible. It's a, it's a team effort as well. Hey, Tim, th we got a question from Matthias and uh, he asked, was there ever a visual effects project or challenge you would have wanted to work on that you didn't? <laughs> uh, well, I, I mean, I still go look back at the Lord of the Rings stuff and I was like, man, that, that would have been a cool project to work on. I think that was uh, some amazing creatures and um, an amazing studio, Weta Digital, you know, they just do some amazing work. Um, I think that's like one place, uh, you know, uh, where I would have, would have liked to work at some point. Okay, cool. We yeah. have another question from uh, Taglar Ozen. Uh, I, hope I, I hope I didn't mess up your name, I apologize. <laughs> he asked us, and I'm not sure if this is something how deep you can get into this, uh, yeah. but he asked uh, to tell us a little bit more about the extraordinary leg rig system on the hero creature, hero creature for Edge of Tomorrow. Um, I know you had mentioned that it was an omnidirectional rig, which yeah. um, is pretty, I don't know if, if that's something you could even touch on or give us at least a high level sort yeah. of, um, you know, speak to about it. Yeah. Yeah, well, um, this was one of those things that evolved as we were kind of, you know, the different brains in the rigging department are teaming up with the R&D department. So at Sony Imageworks, there's an R&D department that specializes in, you know, writing tools and uh, finding solutions for these incredible effects that Sony Imageworks does. And so uh, this rig was really a collaboration of, uh, you know, me creating like I guess you could say an animation rig. So these kind of base tentacle rigs for all the limbs and the arms and, um, and then carrying, um, you know, like things like curves that are, are rigged uh, to that animation rig that we would um, basically hook into like a custom plugin in Maya. And then that we have this tentacle plugin that you see here. And so, uh, so my job would be to like, integrate what R&D is doing into the animation rig so that the animator can kind of see all these tentacles on their animation rig as they're animating. And then of course I would build rigs that would be like low res versions because this is, wasn't the fastest rig when all the tentacles are displayed, but we had some kind of variable resolution settings that an animator can say, put it on like super low res or hide every other tentacle or something like that. And then they could get faster playback. Um, but the meat of this, like all this crazy tentacle work is really that, that plugin um, that was developed by R and D and, and my job was to make sure that it works and that the way the animators are interacting with it um, makes sense and um, gives them the effects that they want. So, you know, another part of this was like, uh, we'd want this leg to have a tip like a, on a point, but then we could have toes or like tentacles spread across the surface as well. So like uh, almost like the foot is planting and the tentacles are like sliding onto the surface. And so that was a collaboration of me providing animation controls that drive the different inputs of this tentacle plugin in Maya. So, um, and then there's a whole nother end that I can't, probably won't even spend time talking about, but it's like then trying to get this whole thing to render. It was a whole nother story. Um, well, I'll tell you what, this is the crowd that's going to definitely appreciate some of this um, getting yeah. into the guts. Uh, so, you know, uh, maybe that's kind of like as you start getting into the workflow or class um, yeah. portion of it, maybe you can 
show us a little bit of some concepts. Um, I know that um, uh, we had a, a question from uh, Matthias, but maybe, you know what, I'm going to save this to the end because it's more okay. of like um, about career, I guess, okay. um, you know, but uh, it has to do with fundamentals um, and okay. things that you would recommend rigors to learn. So we'll just kind of keep that question back um, and maybe we'll save it for towards the end. Okay. okay. That sounds good. Uh -huh. So, um, so I, I just, I guess to conclude about me is that, um, you know, I talked about working in, you know, as a character TD for 20 years um, at various studios and now I'm at Magic Leap. And so I'm, I'm on a new platform. And so it's a mixed reality platform. And I'd say in the last four or five years, I've been getting more into real time. And um, again, that's been a new challenge for me, but it's been really cool. And, and something about trying to get the highest fidelity characters and in animation into a real time uh, environment or a device. And um, so for me, that was kind of new coming into it. Uh, I had done some real time products with like, kind of like uh, mocap and bipedal characters, but uh, Magic Leap is just like a sheer variety of different projects that uh, it's almost like a, um, a science lab. There's like all kinds of experimental graphical things that are happening all the time. So there's all kinds of interesting stuff to rig. And um, I don't really show it here, but we just finished an undersea project, which was basically coral reefs and fish swimming in your room. And uh, that was pretty cool. That was really fun. And it's cool to put on the device and see something you rig swimming by you um, and looking at you and things like that. So that is, it was a whole new experience for me. Uh, wow, it's amazing. Yeah. So let's 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 kind of transition here. Uh, let's yeah. learn a little bit about the way you approach. I mean, you know, I guess my question to you is whether it's as complex a rig as an Optimus Prime from a volume standpoint and parts to, you know, the um, you know the characters from Edge of Tomorrow. Uh, you yeah. know, what are the, the what are your foundations that you kind of uh, you always go in with when you're tackling these problems to solve? Right, yeah. You know, what's great about this course is that it's given me, uh, I guess, an opportunity to kind of sum, sum, summarize, like, my approach to things. Like, it's almost become, like, an intuitive thing that I do when I get on a project. There's, there's like, these things that I do. And in teaching this course, I've kind of looked at all the products I've worked on and tried to, like, uh, write down, like, hey, these are the steps that I do over and over again. When I first start a project, when I start rigging, when animation starts, when maybe character effects or effects uh, gets going and using the rig. Um, and, and so that's what I'm gonna, gonna cover here is about kind of like a, a framework of like the steps that I go through and it kind of covers like the timeline of a project. And so I kind of, my workflow kind of starts at the beginning of a project of information gathering. And so this is when, you know, typically I'm presented with artwork the concept for the movie, the script, uh, animatics and storyboards. And I'm getting, I'm getting an idea of like what the characters that are, that I'm going to need to rig or the team that I'm, I'm working with needs to rig. Um, <clears throat> what, uh, what are the performance requirements? Like what kinds of things do they do? Um, you know, is there a lot of facial performance or is there a lot of, uh, you know, is it an animal and it's kind of a raw visceral of, uh, uh, performance or is it a mechanical performance, you know? And, um, and so the thing about, you know, concept art is that it's ever evolving until it gets approved. So like with Optimus Prime and ILM, you know, I remember like, we just, I would just see this mountain of concept uh, art for Optimus Prime alone, let alone all the other robots and vehicles and things like that. And you can see as, as time goes on and as, you know, we're getting close to like having to start production, they start honing in on a design that they want for the movie, but you always got to be ready for changes because even when things start, things keep changing. And uh, so, um, you know, then another part of this information gathering is uh, talking to other departments. So like I, very early on, I'm talking to modelers, I'm talking to animators about how they think they may want to control a rig. Um, I'll even talk to effects and character effects about their needs. You know, a lot of times, you know, rigs will need like uh, locators or positional information that gets sent down the pipeline. So, you know, uh, lighters can attach lights to the rig or, you know, like for, you know, transformers, again, there's like lots of headlights and things that were hanging off the, the different robots. So um, we would need to provide those points that um, other departments can hook things onto. 
Um, for character effects like class, sometimes there's a whole other rig that you need to provide so they can do class simulation or rigid body dynamics or something like that. Um, but it's always good to kind of know about that stuff ahead of, as ahead of time as you can. And sometimes you can't answer all those questions early on. Um, and sometimes it's an ever evolving uh, project, especially like ones that are, you know, short deadlines, you know, a couple months or less than a year. Um, and another thing is like, I always like to know, um, you know, how does this rig with animation I need to go down the pipeline? So once it's out of animation, how does it need to go on to the next departments? You know, and that's really uh, essential and fundamental to like a, a successful experience on a project with rigging. Um, you know, so, you know, some of what I cover in this class is, is uh, organizing your rig in a way that it's easy to get to the objects that you want to like a Lemba cache or you want to export FBX. Um, and not having to like dig and unwire and, and, and tear apart your rig to get to those nodes. So um, there's a lot of, uh, lot of pre-planning uh, pre you could do to make all that kind of stuff a lot easier. Um, so that's information gathering. And so the reason why I'm showing this clip is that in this course, we're doing a uh, industrial robotic welding arm as our first rig uh, in the class. And, um, and the thing about this model, and I'll, I'll pop it up in mine in a second, is that it, it's kind of deceptively, like it looks simple. It kind of looks like a couple of a segmented arm just kind of you know, pivoting from different points. But when you really look at uh, the, this mechanical device, it's really sophisticated and it's deceptively simple. Um, and I really love the way they move. And uh, on top of that, I really like the fact that um, there's a lot of dangly bits hanging off them, you know, and that's something that, again, I refer back to Transformers is that we had animators doing animation tests with Optimus Prime and the other robots. And it really wasn't until we started adding little bits of jiggle to different parts. Like we have a fender that's like flapping as he's like stomping his foot or he's running, or we have a headlight that's jittering or, uh, you know, moving around as he's turning or something like that. This secondary motion, these secondary parts really sold the scale of the robots. And so we're going to touch on that um, in this um, in this course as well. And so I'm going to talk about a course overview later. I'm kind of jumping ahead, but that's why I'm showing this. So I, uh, we talk about gathering reference, looking at reference, kind of pre-planning our attack for um, rigging uh, an asset. Hey, we have a question from uh, yeah. Jean. Uh, would that uh, research that would call working with uh, mechanical engineers um, is part of your kind of, uh, you know, would you, would you go as far as that? Yeah, I mean, um, you know, we've gotten, like, I've, there's been projects I've worked on where we actu actually got engineering, like, blueprints, you know, of, of devices that we had to build in CG. So a yeah. lot of times there's, um, especially Transformers, I keep going back to that, there's real-world counterparts to some of these things that you're making in CG, you know, like the cars in Transformers. We all, we had to model all those cars. We had to rig those cars. And a lot of those came from plans, um, scan data, things like that. Um, so, so that's a good question. So yeah, a lot of times there's like real world uh, data that you're getting um, that helps you in the process of creating these CG assets. So that's a good question. Perfect, cool. Um, the, the next, you know, the next step, and this is again, kind of a chronological uh, stepping through a production uh, for, from a character GD's perspective, at least my perspective, um, is a 3D model review. So this is a time where modeling is like well underway. Um, and as a character GD, I like to stay on top of the evolution of the models as they're being built and have early conversations about, you know, the resolutions of the models, um, and so, uh, you know, like that all kind of goes back to information gathering. So how close or far away are these rigs going to be seen? How much resolution in the model do we need? Um, what resolution and topology is going to work best for deformation um, and things like that? And I'll, I'll, at this point, like I may start doing little mini rigs on top of this asset. So I won't maybe start jumping into doing a complete rig. And again, this is another thing I, I touch on in the course is quick prototyping. Like I do a lot of prototyping where I'll just pick a segment, like a, a, a challenging segment of this um, robot arm and say, geez, how am I going to approach that? Or, hey, that model, like, you know, is that model um, perfectly symmetrical? Is it going to rotate properly? 
um, and things like that. And so that's uh, part of this step. Um, I also like, I like to get the bottle in front of the animators too. Like a lot of times, you know, animators have worked with lots of rigs with deforming geometry. Um, and they have a lot of cool insight about how things need to look, how things need to crease, how volume needs to be retained. And uh, oftentimes I'm surprised, like, you know, that animator has some great feedback on, um, you know, additional edge loops that might be needed or something like that. And uh, along with that, like, I think this is the, the time where you really need to give uh, model feedback. And so you're looking at the complete model um, as early as you can and trying to give that, that feedback to the modeler and answer those, uh, give them suggestions or, you know, there's times where like I'll model something, I'll change the model and I'll suggest something and say, hey, I think I need some edge loops here and I'll insert some edge loops. And, and you know, they may not necessarily use my model, but they'll use it as a reference for how they insert it. Cool, terrific, excellent. And, and another one that like, I always mention because I swear every product that I work on, I get, there's always like an issue with scale. So that's another thing that I always check early on is to make sure the scale of the model that's being delivered to you that you're gonna rig is basically correct you know so you want to you want to make sure it's not like a thousand uh you know like two decimal places too small or too huge um you know like a, the height of something may change in proportion you know so uh, but you want to make sure that that model is in the realm of the scale for the entire project and that's really essential because i got burned by that so many times where i've completely rigged something only to find out that the scale is incorrect and i need to kind of you know, rework it. Um, and another way to look at this is like, look at other asset, other models on the project and bring them into one wire file and compare them. Does one model look off compared to the others? Um, you know, like Edge of Tomorrow, you know, you bring in a helicopter and it looks way too small compared to a pickup truck. Um, so you want to point that out uh, as soon as possible. And some of that's come as like my role as a supervisor, you know, a lot, a lot of times I'm looking at like all the assets and uh, a lot of times I look at patterns, you know, like what, um, what am I seeing in all these different assets that we need to rig on a project that we may need tools for, or we may use a, co um, a common approach for. Um, and so I just talked about this, the next stage is kind of rig prototyping. And this is kind of a quick stage for me as far as um, I'm doing just segments of the rig. And like for, for Optimus, my approach for Optimus is that I really wanted to get a rig into the animator's hands as soon as possible. So what I what I did was I didn't worry about all the detail of, you know, of pivot points and joints for a fender on the shoulder or anything like that. I got the main body, the arms, the legs, the torso, the head and the neck working with the model. And it was very, it's very rough. So it, like all the internal mechanisms and things were not working. You couldn't, you couldn't grab a control and move those around. But they could do like walk and run cycles um, and kind of like overall body uh, locomotion tests with it. And what was cool about that is that that could keep animation busy, giving me important feedback that I can start incorporating into my next version of the rig, which may include more details. And so, um, so, uh, and that's this first point here on uh, the bullet point is that um, I always look at a rig as how can this overall rig be broken down into smaller tasks? You know, so as, as, as daunting and overwhelming as something like um, Optimus Prime is, is, is looking at the model, I mean, there's thousands of parts, um, is how can I break that down into tangible, doable tasks? You know, so, so that first, you know, getting the body kind of working, and then I would like, I would tackle like an arm and like uh, an arm setup that would allow some give and pistons to work in the shoulder. And how is this chest piece gonna move when his shoulder moves forward? And so I would start diving in deeper to another layer once I've got kind of the primary rig built. Um, and then, you know, then I would get into things like the face um, and that would be kind of the, the next stage. I'm getting, you know, I've got a lot of things worked out and I'm getting into details like facial and lip setups and things like that. Um, uh, this is a good time too to uh, have animators or yourself create range of motion animations for these rigs. And this is this is essential. Like whenever I'm working with mocap, I have this like standardized range of motion mocap that I'll I'll set up my own retarget and I'll retarget this range of motion movement of all the body um, that I can retarget on of the rig that I'm working on at this time. And so 
I use that for when I'm doing all my deformation work, my skinning work, or I'm using other deformers like muscles and, and other setups like that. Um, the a range of motion can just just be such a time saver. Like you as a, as a rigger, you can rotate a shoulder up and rotate an elbow, but once you get like the animation that represents what's gonna be on the project, then you're really kind of working uh, in the right context. Um, this is another good time too, where I, I start identifying you know, like any scripts or tools we might need to like uh, automate some tedious processes. And we cover that in the course too. How much uh, uh, of a scripting background um, or coding uh, do you need to know, I guess? And, or maybe even for your class, can you come in with uh, no coding knowledge or does it help to have a little bit, um, you know? I mean, yeah, I mean, it always helps to have a little bit, but you know, the way that I structure uh, this class is that um, we're always doing things manually first. So we always use, you know, we always go through the menus and we create things first to kind of get the concept that, you know, so you understand the concept of what you're trying to do first by hand. So you're, you're doing it by hand. And then from there, you know, I'll uh, start introducing some, uh, some of the commands with some of the Mel and Python commands that you could use to do some of the same things that you're doing manually. And then the next stage is then taking those commands and building a script with it. So in, in this course, I kind of cover all those stages. And so for somebody who, um, who isn't that familiar with scripting, and, and I'm, I'm more than happy in this course to help people who aren't familiar with scripting, um, is that uh, you, you can do things manually. Uh, there's also uh, what I'm gonna get into the course. I, I do have a, a, what I'm calling a mech rig toolkit that goes with the class, which is a set of uh, tools and scripts that we're going to use and we're gonna talk about how they're created. And so this uh, toolkit is a ba basically a set of Python scripts that are utilities. Um, and also like uh, I have a custom Maya shelf so quick access to those tools and utilities and also a marking menu. Um, so again, as we go through the course, we'll, we'll do things kind of like the old fashioned kind of tedious way. And then as we get to our second rig, so this industrial arm, we do everything kind of manually. We start using some scripts, but we start off everything manually, start using some scripts. Midway through the course, we go through, uh, we look at what we did on that industrial arm and we, we actually code up a couple more tools that'll help us with the next rig, which, we, which we'll do, which is a, a, a little camera bot droid. Um, so uh, to answer your question, um, to sum it up, I guess, is like you really could come in as a great scripter or with no scripting knowledge, and I think you're gonna be okay in this class. Terrific. Uh, speaking of which, when you, um, I know you mentioned you were gonna go uh, potentially and um, show us the, your, your Maya file, uh, might yeah. we get a, a, a quick peek or look at that uh, at some point uh, with yeah. the set that you were talking about? Sure. <clears throat> so um, this is kind of like one of the working files, you know, so we kind of go through different stages of, of building this rig in the class and, um, you know, we kind of break this rig down into different segments. So, you know, we have this base that spins on the Y axis and we have this kind of a shoulder elbow section. We have this twisting segment. We have a hinge segment, and I swear this really reminds me of the APU arm in the Matrix. Um, it's very similar to the way that was set up. But for a rigger, this is really challenging because you have different axes of rotation that have limitations. So here we can rotate only on one axis, here on one axis, here on a twisting axis, here on a hinge axis, and here on another twisting axis. Are you just a curious? Are you showing us something in Maya right now? Oh, I'm sorry, uh, you can't see it. No, we're, we're looking at your slideshow, but it sounded like you're showing us from something from Maya. Oh, you know, I think when I'm sharing, it's only showing uh, one window. Sorry about that. No, no problem. Hey. Window. You just switch it. You just want to be responsive. I was like, oh, you showed yeah, that's good. Cool. There you go. Cool. There we go. Sorry about that, guys. Um, so this is the, uh, the robot arm that we're going to rig in the first half of the class. And again, like I said, this is a decept deceptively challenging rig in that um, each segment of this arm only rotates on pretty much one axis. So it's not like uh, a human shoulder where you have like three degrees of rotation um, or um, a wrist. Um, we have, 
you know, uh, kind of a hinge segment here and here and a twisting segment in this area. I don't know if you can see my cursor. Um, yeah. And then uh, another hinge up here. Uh, we have, uh, you know, the nozzle being able to pivot. Uh, we have a cable set up, which we're going to add like some jiggle dynamics to, like we're seeing in the reference video. So it's the things we called out in the reference that we're going to try to rig in this. Um, but we're also going to get into, um, you know, space switching, which is like, uh, how can I lock this nozzle down onto something that is welding and that thing is moving around and the nozzle is following it. So we're going to look at things like that as well. Um, and it's, it's a relatively, um, you know, it's, it's not super dense. There's a lot of parts. Um, so um, what I'm trying to get people to be comfortable with is like being able to tackle a rig on, on, on pretty heavy models, you know, and not that, not that this is like an Optimus Prime or anything, but um, it's uh, a big part of rigging is managing your models. Um, so if there's like a change to this model, like what's changed? Uh, did it break the rig when I try to re-rig it again? Or how can I update the model cleanly on my rig? Um, so, so that's kind of the industrial arm. And again, this is, uh, this is just one of the, one of the weeks, uh, I think we, I'll go over in the course overview, but we spent a couple of weeks on this uh, and a couple of weeks on the second uh, asset. So let me uh, switch back over. Let's see which one was it. Let me share again. Um, and then kind of, I think this is the last slide for about my workflow is like uh, trying to trying to help or, you know, as animation starts to wind down or animation shots start getting delivered out of animation into other departments, you know, as a rigger, I feel like I'm always involved with like helping to get that data out. Uh, a lot of times it's like getting it out of Maya and getting it into some other platform for either rendering or real time uh, or something like that. It's also, again, like I mentioned before, that handoff of this rig or this character to other departments like character effects, character finaling, um, effects, you know, for simulation work, um, you know, like Slimer and Ghostbusters, you know, we, we would have to I would, I did like actually did some cool flesh sims with that with Ziva, if anybody's familiar with that. And so I had to get my Ziva sim, like I had to get the rig from myself with animation on it, do the, the flesh sims, and then I would have to hand it to the Houdini guys who were doing all the slime and the saliva and stuff like that, that were then layered on top of that. So it was about understanding the needs of the next department down the line, which is really important. And last, I, I like to have a postmortem with people that I work with on a project and like what what went well and what didn't, and what, what can we do to like improve things on the next project? And sometimes that's, that's tools, sometimes that's communication, a lot of times it's communication. Um, sometimes it's uh, conventions and standardizations, like, you know, hey, we kept on having, having uh, to get this file from you, but it was always named differently, you know, and we want a consistent naming convention for that. So things like that, little things like that could just, you know, smooth out an entire production. I've got a question. I got a question from Matthias. Uh, it's a straightforward because you were interesting about communication. He said, what fundamentals would you recommend riggers to learn and know well? The, and I'm not going to answer that. He, he, he mentioned uh, basic vector and matrix math, but I was like thinking even more basic than that, like yeah. file management. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, uh, like, I mean, I know all the other stuff is important on the, but, but from a, teaching perspective and knowing sometimes that basic, you know, how to get people talking about organization, whether yeah. it's a file or whatever. I mean, that's got to be an important foundation to me. Yeah, I mean, I agree. I mean, yeah, there's things like communication. I think of another broad one that I always throw out to people is troubleshooting skills, you know, like, um, you know, I've worked with a wide range of people and like people have various degrees of like digging down into a problem and either like giving up and like can't figure it out or people who really dive in and they figure it out. And I think a character GD needs to kind of have that mindset of like not giving up, you know, like you're going to troubleshoot something or you're going to ask people uh, about this thing you're trying to figure out. Um, I think it, it's, it's the easy way out to kind of like throw your hands up saying like, oh, I can't figure it out. And to Matthias's uh, question, you know, like, 
you know, to be honest, like I'm not, a, I don't come from a math background and I, I'm like somewhat technical when it comes to like scripting and some math, but I don't necessarily write plugins um, in productions that I work on. I'm more actively rigging characters and I really never have the luxury of like having the time to write plugins, you know, and uh, I, I let the smart math guys and programmers and uh, uh, people do that stuff. And then I, I'm kind of like, I'm like the user of that stuff. So I, I like to give them feedback. I like to use it and test it and say, hey, this is cool, but it needs these fun this functionality. Um, and uh, so I think that troubleshooting is a, is a big one that if you came in and you didn't know a lot about rigging, but you were a great troubleshooter, I think you're gonna be able to pick it up. You're gonna like on products where I need to know more vector math, I'll dive into that. But on other products where I don't, the tools are already set up and they're figuring out a lot of that stuff for me. And there's, there's, there's products where like, I, I don't do a lot of mathematical stuff. Yeah. Um, and I, I kind of like, I go all over the place, you know, like right now I'm, I'm doing a lot of work with FBX. And so I'm, I'm all about writing the FBX exporters and exporting data out in certain formats. So that's, that's like where my head is at this week. The next week it might be like, rigging a character or writing an animation tool or something like that. So you really got to kind of hop around where, where it's needed, where the fires need to be put out. Or even better, prevent them. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Prevent them as much as you can. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so next, I don't know if you wanted to uh, touch on anything else at this point, but I was going to jump into the course overview. Yeah, let's do it. I mean, I uh, just noticed the time and I'm like, holy smokes, man. Yeah. So it's going by yeah, fast, yeah. but it's it's flying by. I'm having a party here. Hopefully, uh, the attendees are are digging this too. So um, anyway, Great. well, this this will be pretty brief because I've been kind of hitting on it as we've been going. But uh, you know, we have an eight week course, and it's kind of broken into uh, a couple different sections. So uh, overall, we're going to be rigging two assets. We're going to rig this robot arm um, and this camera bot. Uh, the robot arm has like some optional things that I'm, I'm trying to see how the class goes that either we'll get into or we won't have time for. So um, I want to get into like cable dynamics for this, but I'm saving it for like week eight for when we have time uh, to get into that or for the people who have time to get into that. So we'll be rigging most everything and then we'll try to save stuff like that um, as a bonus uh, for the end because uh, it gets a little involved. Um, so the course intro, we start with introducing the course and the mechanical rigging toolkit, how to install it, what it's all about, um, how to use it. Uh, and there's, um, there's uh, help docs that come with that. And of course, I'm a resource for any questions. Then I, I go into, uh, it's more like one and a half weeks, almost two weeks of mechanical rigging foundations. So this is more to get the whole class on the same page about terminology and concepts and things that we're going to be doing in this class. So um, we hit on everything from, you know, uh, finding accurate pivot points um, to creating proper skeleton joint chains to creating proper joint orientation on joints for IK. Um, just really kind of like essential stuff that if that's not right, your rig's really not going to be right. And so it's really, it's the foundation for a good rig. And I, I feel like that's a really important part of this course and uh, you're going to be using those foundational concepts in the rigs that we do uh, in the later weeks. So the, the first rig we, uh, and we do some like mini rigs. So I have like uh, some mechanical parts that we get into. Then we'll just do some mini rig as homework exercises. And then our first complete asset is this, um, this uh, welding, this uh, industrial welding robot. Uh, then we take a week to kind of retool. We look at what we did with the industrial welding robot. Uh, we turned some of the things we were doing manually into tools that we could use um, and save ourselves some time with like tedious repetitive tasks. And this is a good time for anybody who's not that familiar with scripting to kind of raise their hand and, and ask questions and why are, why are you doing that? What does this syntax mean? What does this command mean? Things like that. Um, and then we finish off with the camera bot quad rig. And this is a, this is kind of a cool rig. It's a, Deceptively simple as well, too. There's a lot of parts here, uh, but one thing that we get on uh, get into is uh, is creating kind of like a rig module. So you can see this is a quad leg. We have four legs here, and instead of like rigging each one of those individually, we create kind of a leg rig module um, with some scripting. So we'll rig the leg, um, 
you know, by hand one time, and then we'll see kind of the pattern that we've used to build that leg and then we'll turn it into a script. And so we'll build the script that builds that leg that we can use to build all the three other legs. And that's another thing that in production, you got to find ways to, to save time, be efficient. And so this is one way where like, if I had five different quad rigs on, on a project that I would want to, I'd want to develop kind of a, leg rig, uh, a leg rigging system that I can quickly rig those legs, uh, let alone the whole character as fast as I can. Um, but we'll get into things like um, LODs, you know, so we'll have like another uh, model resolution. We'll do an FBX export of it. We'll get it into Unreal um, and just look at how our rig organization is, is helping us to do that. So that, that's terrific for those who are involved with interactive or, or games as well. So this this definitely um, what you're covering is basically foundational stuff that could yeah. be important to film. Uh, animation and or um, game rigging as well. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think that's that's where I think my experience is kind of unique in that I've been doing a lot of VFX feature animation and then I've also been doing the real-time stuff and I can kind of see the different needs and, and have experience with both. And I see that there's a lot of pre-planning you need to think about before you start building a rig so that you're going to be able to export this, this uh, camera bot to Unreal like um, very easily, like maybe through a script or by just, uh, you know, baking the animation and then sending it to Unreal and getting good results and predictable results. Perfect. So uh, I had slides for each one of these, but I kind of covered it by just talking. So this is just the foundations. This is the industrial robotic arm rig that we'll be doing. We've seen it um, this week where we kind of retool um, the CamBot rig. And um, the goal of this course, again, I've kind of been hitting on some of this stuff, is just giving you some confidence to tackle complex mechanical rigs. So, you know, you're given really complex model and like how you can break it down into smaller parts, um, some solid rigging foundations. And I don't cover every single foundation you could have as a rigger, but I, I, I think I cover some important ones, at least for this course, that you can carry on uh, into your own work. Um, and uh, in this mech rig toolkit is something that I think is a good example of something that you could use as a template and you could, you could create your own toolkit for whatever you do. Like maybe you rig faces as well. So you could create like a face rigging toolkit and use this as a template for those kind of tools. So um, kind of to sum it up, that's, that's, uh, that's the course. I'm really excited about it. I'm really looking forward to uh, teaching it. And, and as a teacher, I've always learned a lot from the students that I've taught. So I'm looking forward to, you know, getting your questions and, and trying to answer them. And, uh, and if I don't know the answer, trying to find the answer. Um, um, I just wanted to uh, start kind of segueing actually into maybe some of the questions that uh, we've been getting. And um, uh, I wanted to kind of uh, address them because some of them are really cool. Uh, for example, um, from uh, Jean Vernet um, from France, uh, he had a question about um, the rigging on Optimus Prime, um, and he asked if basically was the model for the human animation for Optimus Prime uh, a different type of model compared to when he transformed to a car? Um, mm -hmm. You know, was was it one big massive super rig, or were there kind of like, well, if he's animating as a human, you know, we kind of um, you know, kind of have a rig that biases that, or can you, yeah. what would be the approach? Because it sounds like to me, the class is sort of almost the, the answer in some ways, because it's smaller systems to bigger systems. Yeah, well, it's interesting. I've, I definitely have been asked that question before. It's a good question. And I've, you know, some people have asked me, is there like a slider that transforms it from truck to Optimus? And I'm like, <laughs> oh, I, I wish, <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> no, it's, it, uh, there was definitely like um, for each one of the robots, there was a, a separate car rig. So uh, like for Optimus, like I rigged a semi truck uh, rig that was its own asset that was totally separate from the Optimus Prime robot rig. Um, and um, what's cool is I actually got to animate uh, two shots um, in, in um, Transformers on, on the uh, highway chase. So it was like one of those rare opportunities where a rigger gets to use his own rig to animate, you know, and, uh, but I had to do a transformation shot. So I had to do a shot where 
I literally had to have Optimus transfer from tr uh, transform from truck to robot. And so this is the shot where um, uh, he's, uh, the, the semi truck is going down the freeway, being chased, goes under the underpass, and starts transforming and and turning into Optimus to turn around and battle with uh, I think it was Bone Crusher I think. And um, so in the case of that, we would actually and it's funny it's like it's such a, such a hack, but it would, we would actually I would pose Optimus inside of the truck rig. So you have this um, folded up version of Optimus inside of the volume of the truck model. And so um, another cool thing that we had on Transformers was that uh, for any one shot, an animator could add their own custom mini rigs. So these mini rigs would hang off the main rig. Um, so for Optimus, um, you know, I rigged a lot of the detail, but sometimes there's be a shot where like, uh, I want to grab these two individual parts that have separate rigs and I want them to move together. So I want to actually kind of re-rig these parts as an animator for this one shot. So we gave them a tool where they could select two parts and, and say, give me a mini rig for that. We called it the stack tool. And so they would then, um, through some parent constraint um, switching, uh, those two pieces would, would uh, be rigged underneath a, uh, a procedurally or scripted built control. And so, um, so going back to the question, so as uh, I was using this uh, kind of like mini rig tool to like custom rig uh, parts of the truck kind of peeling away or poking out and, and disappearing, then I would be animating the leg of Optimus sticking out, you know? So it's like animating two separate rigs in tandem. Um, and then it was just like a mess of geometry. So it was like, you would, uh, and, and more so in other shots, maybe not so much in my shop, but I, I remember like opening up some shots and I would see like there was a transformation that would literally be pieces of geometry that would be animated to go behind the camera to, to be hidden away. So it was like a total cheat. Um, so you would see a piece fly around and then it would like zip and go behind the camera so it would be like uh, not seen by the camera, not rendered. Um, so in other words, pure filmmaking. Yeah, exactly. So there was no like magic, you know, it was industrial light magic, but there was no magic transform button or script or anything like that. So, I mean, there was, there were some animators that were doing some amazing stuff on that. I didn't even know how they started to animate some of those transformations. Wow. That's amazing. Um, there's a couple of other questions we got. I, um, I got one from Lawrence uh, Grijalva. Okay. I don't know if I pronounced his name right. Uh, he's got a long lead up to it, um, but I think um, he said, he, his question was, what is your initial approach to solving mechanical components such as hydraulics? And do you prefer constraints, channel links, et cetera? I'm not sure um, if that's just a sort of all of the above or depending on your situation, but I'll let you answer that and see if that is a relevant question to yeah. you. Yeah, I, yeah, I mean, I think that, that's a good question and it kind of hits on some of the things I talked about, um, but more in a practical sense. Uh, but, you know, I, like the one thing, like I kind of determine like whether I'm going to constrain things or skin things based on what the end delivery of the rig is. So um, if things are going to be Alembic cached, you know, a lot of times I'll, um, you know, I'll, I'll rig them things one way. If I'm, I'm going to do an FBX that's going to go into Unreal, I'll typically skin them. Um, so like if it was like this cam bot that's going to Unreal, I would skin any pistons or this all the geometry here to the joints. Um, and again, I'd be careful about like the number of influences uh, per vertex and, um, and things like that uh, to keep it kind of optimized uh, as much as possible. Um, but uh, I tend to do more skinning uh, than I used to. Like so before where like I would use a lot more constraining on my end geometry going down the line I think now with like the computing power we have that I, I feel like I'm getting away with more uh, with deformed objects. So um, skinned objects, um, you know, limbic cache, uh, FBX uh, exporting, you know, skinned and blend shape geometry into Unreal, uh, things like that. So I hope that helps, uh, but you know, a piston or something like that, it all comes down to starting with the right pivot points first, getting your joint placement correct skinning the pieces to those joints and then getting it out of my if need be. 
Do you, um, uh, Juan has got a question about, um, I guess, do you have a preferred setup? Uh, for example, like to-dos, desk monitors, assets, nomenclature, program setup, answer, anything, if anything special in terms of the way you work uh, to get your job done. I mean, I don't know if uh, when you opened up your, your uh, version of Maya, I know you mm -hmm. had your shelf tools, you had a script stuff, but I'm not sure if there's anything more you can add to that. Yeah, you know, I mean, that really is the core of like, I like to have my tools accessible and organized, you know, and so I think that's one of the reasons why I developed this toolkit in the way I did is that like, it's, it's like all my tools for any particular type of thing I need to do kind of encapsulated under one directory, you know, like I could literally like zip up the mecha rig toolkit and bring it to another machine and unzip it and you're going to have the exact same toolkit that I'm using. Um, and it's not, um, and I talk about this in the course, it's like when I first started using Maya, like everybody knows that when you use Maya, you're always using scripts from all over the place. And it's, I always had a hard time like managing the scripts or like I'd be working on one machine and I have all the scripts I, I need, but then I, for some reason I have to go over to another machine or uh, I'm at work and, or I change jobs. And then all of a sudden like, oh, you know, where are all the scripts that I need to do my job? And so that's where like having like, uh, you know, good organization, organized tool set is, is good. And then I really hit on the course too, is like accessing those tools. So I, I'm really a big proponent on like shelf tools. Um, and I don't know if I could uh, share so we could uh, see that, but let's switch over to my You know, so like, you know, this is the Macrig Toolkit shelf. So like having these drop, drop down menus that access the tools, the scripted tools in the Macrig til, uh, Toolkit. Um, you know, so I don't have to like run commands in the script editor all the time. I mean, I still use the script editor quite a lot, but you know, when I want to lay a locator, uh, when I create a locator on a vertex, I just go to this menu and drop it down and it's, uh, it's calling that script in the toolkit. And um, I think that's like the biggest thing, uh, uh, my whole workflow, like accessing my tools, um, accessing, you know, the assets um, and things like that that I need to uh, work with. Perfect, excellent. Um, we have uh, one other, well, we have a couple other questions, but, um, Got another question from Matthias, um, and it's kind of a more on a sort of a, who comes through from you. Um, he says, uh, which department do you want to give a hug? Now, I'm, tr I'm, I'm imagining the department he's talking about is just within the production pipeline. Yeah. Who winds up being the most help to you and your job, and why? No matter the reason. Hmm. That's like, a really good question, and almost my hugs change as the pro as a project goes down the line. <laughs> um, I don't know, like I've always like, there's been projects where like, if I have a good relationship with the modeler who's modeling the assets I rig, that's like awesome because then there's like this real collaboration with the person who's providing you with the model that you're gonna rig and um, who's, who's up for like feedback and who's up for changing things to make your life a little easier. Um, Another one that I always like heavily rely on are like pipeline people um, and uh, people who provide the tools and who, uh, you know, were like, um, you know, the, the naming conventions and the standards that uh, like publishing tools and things like that and get everybody who's working on production on the same page and make things like reliable. Um, and, uh, and then there's animators, you know, so like, you know, I swear there's times where like, I see some some animator do something with a rig that I created that's just amazing, and I'm just like, man, I'm like, I'm just astonished. And I want to give them a hug. So that's a hard question to ask, and I think it kind of <laughs> covers the whole gamut. And the same with the, the rendering TDs; they'll render you know something that's been rigged and animated. And you're just like, oh my god! I still remember like Pirates of the Caribbean, like working on some of that and seeing the renders and not knowing that are those guys in suits or is that actual CG renders of creatures and characters and just being like flabbergasted how good the rendering was. Okay. Cool, excellent. I have a question for you. I just wanted to jump in there uh, a little bit before you had the opportunity. There's been a lot of change, obviously, in our business in the last, uh, you know, tech, even five years, never mind 10, 15, 20 years. Um, but I, I guess my question, just because you've sort of been on this 
the big part of the arc in terms of the evolution of CG, um, you know, has rigging uh, fundamentally changed in any core principled way uh, compared to, let's say, like the changes that happened uh, when we went from modeling to digital sculpting or when we went from texturing in Photoshop to, um, you know, going into, uh, you know, PBR workflow, you know, right. are there any uh, evolutions within the, uh, the rigging, uh, you know, discipline that sort of have undergone some of these uh, miraculous, seemingly miraculous changes? Yeah, I mean, there's, I mean, there's just an incredible amount of uh, new tools and approaches and um, computing power that are offered now. Like, you know, I, you know, I keep I, hitting on like Ziva Dynamics has this like flesh simulation tool now that you can buy. Where like years ago, I would I would have killed to have something like that, and and to have these like kind of high level. Um, resources like you know also even like assets like you can buy like incredibly cool retopologized scan models online now i mean that's you could do mocap online you know it's, it's this incredible amount of resources that are available and i i think that's been a big change that there's a there's a lot of cool new ways to solve these problems that maybe were um you know maybe not close to impossible but like very tedious to do before but now that you know these workflows have been improved and and just like so many artists and, and TDs have done so many different products, there's like all new kinds of approaches to doing things. And so, you know, you go to CGraph or you take a class. Um, you know, I look at CGMA's class lineup and there's stuff that I'd love to take, you know, on, on facial rigging and things like that, that I know that I'm gonna learn some cool new technique that somebody used at Weta. And um, you know. There seems like with online courses like CGMA, you know, you have these mentors that are available to you online where before, like, you have to seek them out. Like, I would always, I would have to, like, you know, go to these, like, kind of meet and greets and, and talk to people and try, try to get a conversation with somebody who was an expert in something. But now you can kind of do it online. You can find that mentor that's in the discipline that you're interested in and take a class for them for, uh, you know, a couple hundred dollars. Um, and there's a lot of free tutorials and stuff on YouTube that's available too. Um, uh, that can get you started with things. So I, I think those are the kind of the big changes, like the resources available to people now. Terrific. Uh, I had one other question before because we're going to have to start wrapping up. So I'm going to make this sort of the the last question for the Q and A portion of the webinar. I see that we've gone over a few minutes. Yeah. Uh, Cesar Souza had a question about. Um, I guess uh, when you're putting together, if you're like, let's say, an you know, entry level or junior level rigging, or if you're trying to show examples of what a good um, rig reel would look like, uh, if you, you know, you're a seasoned professional, mm -hmm. and we're talking now about the next generation of, of, of young uh, riggers and people who are basically going to pay our industry forward. Mm -hmm. What are the kinds of things does Tim Coleman want to see in a reel? <laughs> I mean, uh, that's a good question. And I've seen a lot of reels. <clears throat> and I, I have to say the ones that really stand out to me are, uh, you know, if somebody's like trying to get a rigging, a rigging position, is that somebody's like solving a problem in a unique way or an innovative way. And um, they're not just taking like a standard model that you can download somewhere and rigging it kind of like the way everybody else would rig it you know so maybe you know they they pick you know some kind of interesting mechanical object and they rig it using kind of a cool control system or they you know have a cool setup a unique setup and they kind of break it down and maybe show some complementary tools that they've created that are used with that rig um, but that, that always stands out a lot more to me than just like the standard like um, basic biped guy that's just kind of going through a range of motion. That really doesn't tell me much as somebody does hiring of, of character TDs. It's more about uh, somebody who's a problem solver or a creative problem solver like I hit on before, um, who obviously had to like really think about what they did, what they're showing me. Um, and I, I think that's, that's the biggest tip I would give. So it sounds like to me then uh, variety potentially, uh, not just characters, not just props, but something that showcases something specific, 
um, that forces problem solving in a unique way. Yeah, and, and I think along with that, not to get confused, like, and there shouldn't, it doesn't need to be a quantity of different material. Like, I'd rather see one really solid example of your rigging skills and, and troubleshooting and creative uh, problem solving than, uh, you know, 20 kind of mediocre rigs or, or not very standout pieces. Um, that, that, that really kind of sticks out to me. Okay, cool, terrific. Well, I hate to say it, man, but <laughs> time has flown by. Uh, really nice. uh, I, I don't know about you guys, the attendees here, but I could have asked like at least another five more questions on my front, but I realized that for everyone's lives, for some of you have been up in the wee hours in the morning, I don't want to <laughs> disrespect that level of commitment uh, by going <laughs> longer than we needed to, but I also want to say how much enthusiasm that I personally have for the subject, uh, and I'm so grateful. Uh, we're so grateful to have someone like you, an industry veteran who is uh, looking to share uh, some amazing uh, information with our students. Um, so I just want to personally thank you on behalf of the CG Society and the CGMA, uh, myself, and many want to just thank Tim Coleman. Let's like give him a hand, virtual claps. <laughs> <laughs>